Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome co-chairman of Enterprise Connect and publisher of NoJitter.com, Fred Knight. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Delight, delighted to see you. Thank you for coming to Enterprise Connect 2013. Uh, we're going to, we've got a full hour, uh, and so I'm gonna not have any kind of opening remarks. Let's just get to what we need to do. Uh, Unified Communications has changed so much of how we approach the problem of communications and collaboration. One of the other things that it, Unified Communications has done is brought a whole new crop of players into the business. And uh, three years ago, we began a, a project that we called the Innovation Showcase, where we would identify, we'd have a competition, and let startup companies uh, present uh, their ideas and a panel of judges who are both enterprise uh, executives and analysts would review and pick some winners. We're gonna take a few minutes in front of the UC Summit and also in front of the Afternoon Summit on Mobility to introduce our four winners. There'll be two introduced to you in front of this session. I'll take about 10 minutes and the uh, remaining two will be introduced at the one o'clock summit. Uh, here to uh, uh, present to you the Innovation Showcase, give you a little more details about it and present the winners, is a guy by the name of Dave Michaels. Dave is a distinguished analyst with a firm called Talking Points. He's also the only analyst with a firm called Talking Points. He's the cook, the bottle washer, the president of the company, Dave Michaels. Thanks, Fred. Yes, things are changing in UC quite a bit. It's, you can see it with the number of uh, new exhibitors on the exhibit hall, and you could also see it in the Innovation Showcase. This year, we got 20 applicants, and they were across all over the map. They were, we had cloud, premise, we had voice, IM, video, everything. So there's a lot of stuff going on in this industry. I wanted to... Uh, this causes a lot of debate. How do you pick four, and I want to emphasize this four, we pick four companies, we don't rank the four within that four. So the, we're gonna have two now, two later, they're not ranked. Uh, how do you pick four innovative companies? And innovation is a very slippery concept. It's, it's obvious, you know, when it's something brand new and nobody's ever done it before, that's innovative. But there's more to it than that. And if you look at the, the iPad as an example, which is normally considered a very innovative device, it was really just a form factor change from the iPod Touch. And so that was the innovation, was the changing the size. And so sometimes innovation is more about uh, a new twist or a new angle to existing technologies. And so it causes a lot of conversation and debate as we look at these different companies. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first company that's going to present today. The company is called Nexistent. The presenter is, uh, I'll introduce him in just a moment. Uh, video is moving out of the meeting room paradigm. And we've been talking about video conferencing for a long time, but now we're seeing video take different shapes and different applications. We're seeing it mostly in software-based environments. But this company, Nexistent, uh, offers a hardware-optimized video solution that is a new take on an old problem. So with that, Larry O'Connell. Thank you, Dave. Good morning, welcome to Enterprise Connect. Thanks for having me. My company, Nexistent, has a product called the Virtual Attendant. It's a high-definition video conferencing solution for applications like reception and concierge and other remote expert services. It's a simple concept, great value proposition. Let me show you how it works. It's Monday morning. Uh, John is uh, coming in. He has an early morning meeting. He's had a great weekend. Like most people who've had a great weekend, he has no idea what to do with his badge. He has a friendly face waiting for him. Jessica, she takes care of him and sets him up with a temporary employee badge. She knows the, all of the uh, company policies. She's got access to the tools she needs. She creates a professional, professional, knowledgeable image for the company. And she does this for about 25 minutes a day on average, about 6% efficiency. 
In the new world, Jessica and her teammates are in a central location, call center style, and she uh, responds to a call that John makes by hitting a touch screen, and she does the same service for him, but this time she remotely dispenses a temporary badge. A few minutes later, Michelle comes into the lobby. Jessica is busy handling a different lobby, and so her teammate, Cesar, takes care of Michelle by printing her out a uh, visitor sticky badge and sets her up in the visitor management system. And finally, John and Michelle have their meeting. They have had all of these services of traditional lobby reception at a fraction of the cost of staffing every lobby on the corporate campus. It's easy to see lots of applications for this concept. Besides lobby reception, uh, in a retail store, it's simply getting help on finding a product, uh, getting quick Q&A on a mortgage or a refi at a retail bank, um, and finding your way through a children's hospital, a university, or a big hotel like this one. Lots of applications. The list goes on and on for a, a simple concept of a video uh, concierge or virtual attendant. So how do you do it by having a nice low-cost solution um, that scales and is a truly good alternative to staffing? Uh, the first is to create a really good AV experience and provide the transactional devices that will support uh, the, whatever needs to be done. The second and the most important piece is a highly trained agent that can maintain a great face-to-face -face experience with a guest and still be able to do their job with software and hardware tools that you provide. Finally, there's the heavy lifting, installation, maintenance, and support. This needs to be done quickly and easily so we can quickly roll this out and replicate the services uh, that we had before. Our software is what brings this all together. The first is device control. This is probably the most important piece of the software side. Uh, being on a video conference and telling somebody who is dealing with a remote kiosk that they can do it is not a virtual attendant. Controlling the actual experience and the flow of the transaction, that's a virtual attendant. Skills-based routing. I need to find a Spanish-speaking person with expertise on this product. Let's route the video to the right person. Reporting. Taking uh, a record of everything that happened, the transaction, the type of transaction, the length of that transaction, call center style so we can do the appropriate analytics on the performance of the system. And then finally, the diagnostics, the troubleshooting information to make sure the system is up and running and providing the same services as staffing. Our software is the key. We deliver the entire solution. We could not do it without our partners. We do work with hardware, video conferencing, cloud, and service partners to deliver the entire solution. These are great companies. I would encourage you to check them out and also visit the ones that are here at the show today. And with that, thanks very much. Enjoy the show. Thank you, Larry. So there's a, a kiosk, a hardware kiosk. There's an agent desktop. There's a call center app. And then there's also a portal, an administrative portal. That's right. Okay. So you mentioned the different verticals. The, uh, the obvious one that always comes to mind is the, the lobby, the receptionist. Where else are you, are you seeing the traction? Sure. Lots of exciting activity uh, in areas where there's digital signage being dropped in, university campuses, hospitals. Those are obvious places to add a video help desk, the same infrastructure that we can leverage. Also, um, it, it, it bridges the gap between um, the face-to-face -face, uh, helping in a retail store and what you can do online. That's bridging the gap between that SKU catalog. So the retail interest. store is typically you're asking for assistance within the store, or yes. is it going somewhere else to a specialist? Uh, well, it, it depends on the size of the operation. Uh, we work with companies that have uh, big, big staff that they just want us to train. Um, it's easy to see the smaller you get, a call center service uh, would, would, uh, would support it. Now, when you talk about the remote concept, are you seeing it on premise or are you seeing it in the cloud or what's. what's... Yeah, ex excellent question. In traditional uh, Fortune 500 uh, companies, you would naturally expect to see the, the equipment deployed in the data center, but we're seeing more and more interest in delivering the entire solution from the cloud. It's, it's a nice, low cost way to do it, it's stable, and we can go worldwide quickly. We're seeing a lot more of that, and naturally, the smaller you are, uh, the more attractive that is. And when you talk about delivering an entire s solution from the cloud, does that mean that you're actually offering the staffing on the, on the remote end? Uh, Usually not the staffing. When we work with big companies, we usually uh, they, they bring in their own people and we train them really well to deliver the, the, uh, the service that they, they're going to offer. Um, but the smaller you are, uh, the more interesting it is to use a, a third party. And we're talking mostly with marketing uh, call center types to, uh, to deliver that. Very good. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Dave. So thank you. The Innovation Showcase is a, a booth on the exhibit hall. It is booth 1128, where you can meet with all of our, our four companies. Our next company uh, is a feature-rich voice and messaging platform, and it's aimed at developers to deploy voice, SMS, uh, basically to communications enable their applications. 
And uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Mike Loricella from Plevo. Thanks. Thanks. It's great to be here. Again, Mike Loricella with uh, Plevo. Um, Real quick, at a high level, what Plevo is about is we're trying to address a, a fundamental challenge, and that is that communications, in our opinion, moves too slow. That it takes too long to develop, too long to prototype, too long to bring new solutions to market. And what we want to do is eliminate much of that burden by eliminating a lot of the infrastructure burden that people typically have to deal with in terms of hosting and managing and setting up everything and doing all this insane amount of work before they ever get to that critical part, which is what we're here to talk about today, which is innovation. With Plevo, we want to short circuit that, enable our developers, our enterprises, our carrier customers um, to just be able to get straight to innovation and build great things on top of the Plevo cloud and leverage our, our platform to do so. So another way to, to think about what Plevo is about is, is by an analogy. We want to be to communications and messaging what Amazon Web Services has become to, well, web services and infrastructure, right? There are countless companies that could go out and did in the past, and they would rack and stack, stand up a ton of servers, and do all of those painful tasks. They don't do that anymore. Why don't they? Because they go to an Amazon or a soft layer or a rack space. Because it's cheaper, it's faster, it's easier, and it's better. And that's what we want to be with Plevo as well. We want to do that for communications and messaging. We realize that that's a lofty goal. Um, the great thing is we've got a great team of investors behind us that also have lofty goals and have invested in a few companies that, that you guys probably recognize. So we're excited to hopefully someday be the, the next one on that list that uh, other young startups are talking about here in the near future. So I've kind of talked about this at a high level in terms of different things that you can do, and, and it's a platform, and, and people kind of always look at me like, well, what does that mean? What can I really do? Well, the best thing is probably by example. So first, let's say you need to build a great call center solution. We already have companies doing that today on top of us. Um, one great reference one is called Tacular, an amazingly innovative call center solution that I think if you, if you took the time to look at it, it would completely blow your mind what they're doing with a pure web-based solution. And they're doing that purely built on top of Plevo, leveraging our APIs, and of course bringing in a great deal of their tremendous development expertise. Call tracking, another huge area, and, and we enable companies to do very well there. Voice broadcasting, uh, build your own phone system on top of Plevo, um, also very possible. So why do they come to us? They come to us for scale. So we use the same infrastructure companies, we layer our platform on top, we deliver that global scalability. We also make it very simple. So our focus is on giving you the right APIs, XML, helper libraries, SDKs for, for the web, iOS, Android, and all of that is just openly available at plevo.com forward docs. Another key and critical point about Plevo is that we're 100% open. We're not gonna try and lock anybody into doing things the way that we think you should do them. What we're gonna do is we're gonna enable you to leverage your existing SIP infrastructure and we're going to be able to receive calls in and send calls out to your infrastructure over SIP, completely bypassing the, that lovely PSTN. And we're also going to enable you to bring your own carriers as well. So if you want to plug in whichever carrier you have a relationship with, we're going to enable you to do that. We're not going to force you to use our carrier services and pay our minute prices and things of that nature. So we want to fully support the enterprise, and we think that'll support the carrier as well. So with that, I want to thank everybody for this great opportunity. Um, WebRTC, we know, is a hot topic. We're actually going to be demoing that a little bit later today. So we'd love to have you come and check that out. So thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. So there, there's other types of API cloud services. How, how is Plevo different? Yeah. So yeah, there definitely are some other guys out there. Um, I think the way we've focused on our, our scalability and our ability to deliver QoS with some of the special attention that we've given to the way we handle media, we think is a key differentiator. Um, the openness that we bring. So we're not gonna force anybody into different carrier services if they wanna leverage us in whichever way um, and just use us for the platform. We're 100% we're about that. We really wanna be laser focused on, on being that best of breed platform in the cloud. So if you can bring your own carrier, how do you charge? What's, what, normally it's a per minute charge or yeah. something. So we can have two models um, when someone's bringing their own carrier. We can still charge per minute for SIP minutes in and out, 
or we can just go to a very simple session-based model. So all we care about is how many concurrent calls you have on top of Plevo, and, and we charge you accordingly. Okay, you mentioned that six-letter word, WebRTC. Uh, how do you help companies explore or, or develop yeah. WebRTC? So WebRTC, apparently it's a, a little bit of a, of a buzzword here at the show. Um, so really to us, since we fully support SIP, WebRTC is just another endpoint to us. So, you know, like when I work and use Plevo every day, I have my IP phone sitting on my desk, and then I also am just logged into my browser, and phone call comes in. It, it's just another endpoint. Um, so I say that not, not to diminish it, because it's a very powerful and flexible endpoint, but with Plevo, you, you have that today. I mean, if you wanted to be in market with WebRTC tomorrow, Plevo.com. What are organizations doing with WebRTC that you're seeing? The, the first and kind of the lowest hanging fruit is definitely call center. You know, they control the environment, they can control the browser. On the agent browser. side or on the on, on the agent side, yeah. So we're seeing that deployed in the call center. We've got a lot of uh, call centers rolling out on us today. Um, I think next applications, we're going to see it you know, integrated into e-commerce. It's going to be everywhere. Obviously, we've got some, some browser compatibility things we're, that we're all working through. Very good. Thank right. you. Thanks, Dave. So remember, all four companies are in booth 1128. And with that, Fred, I think it's uh, summit time. OK. Thanks, Dave. Right on time, brother. Um, well, so here we are. And there have been sessions going on all morning, as you know. Uh, but we thought that unified communications as a focus and as a topic made an awful lot of sense for the opening general session. UC is, of course, a set of capabilities. It's also uh, a, an overarching concept. And everything that is lumped into enterprise communications and collaboration kind of fits within the UC bucket. I think that we began programming uh, at Enterprise Connect on unified communications in about 2006. And uh, it was, uh, uh, people weren't sure just what the heck to make, to make of it. Here it is six years later, and we've named this uh, session, Is UC Moving Toward a New Plateau or Towards a Cliff? Because there still is some confusion about just what to make of unified communication and the tra trajectory that it's on. So that's going to be our focus for the next 40 or so minutes. And we couldn't have a better group of panelists uh, to uh, discuss the issue. Uh, it'll be a roundtable conversation, no PowerPoints, thank God. It'll just be a conversation. I invite you to send your uh, questions, uh, fill out question cards. They'll be collected during the session and fed up to us on stage, OK? So let's begin. Uh, we're introducing them in alphabetical order by company. First, uh, I'm happy to introduce you to Gary Barnett, Senior Vice President and General Manager at Avaya. Gary? We're going to walk down. Hey, Gary. Great. We'll Thanks. walk down here. Okay, You'll sir. Take this seat over here. This is the one with the whoopee cushion. <laughs> uh, next up, Rowan Trollop from Trollop, Senior Vice President, General Manager, Collaboration Technology Group at Cisco. I apologize. Nice to see you. How do you pronounce it? Trollop. Okay. Uh, right. Next, I'm happy to introduce you to right. Jan Linden. Jan is Senior Product Manager at Google. If you were in the WebRTC session, you saw uh, Jan earlier this morning. Jan? Hey, Dan. Thank you. Next, from Microsoft, Giovanni Mezjek, I apologize, General Manager, <laughs> Link Marketing at Microsoft. I apologize. Mezgets, Mezgets. Yeah. I'm calling you Giovanni. From, from the, uh, next, Todd Landry, Senior Vice President, NEC. Todd. Fred, good morning. Good to see you. Good to see you. And from Siemens, Mike Fasciani, Senior Vice President and General Manager. OpenScape Voice and UC. We have an extra chair, apparently. And my colleague and uh, 
co co moderator. Oh, you know what? We moved the seats wrong. Uh, slide down one. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> now I get the one with the whoopee cushion. This sucks. Okay. Uh, there we go. I want to introduce our, the co moderator, ahead, Jim Burton, president of CT Link and UC Strategies. Thanks, Fred. Yeah. <laughs> oh, great. First session, and I screwed up already. St. <laughs> Patrick's Day, right? <laughs> For sure. So, uh, we named this session, uh, is UC moving towards a new plateau or towards a cliff? Uh, and we did that because the, the market data that we get, that we have access to or see, is so confusing. PBX sales kind of flat, phones up, UC licenses, number that are out there growing, Activated UC licenses, not so much. Uh, it's, it's just not clear what the UC story is. So let's begin kind of with the, the notion of, from your perspective and your companies, is UC moving towards a new plateau or is it moving towards a cliff? Why don't we start with you, Gary, and we'll just slide on down. Sure. Well, I, I certainly think that uh, one, it's not moving toward a plateau, but I think it's certainly on the rise, and it'll just be a continual rise. Uh, you, you mentioned phones up. We're certainly seeing uh, a huge surge in bring your own device. We're seeing a huge surge in multiple devices per user. Uh, we're seeing new applications come into play, and I think we're in the pretty early stages still. So I think what we'll see is we'll just continue to see this nice steady climb uh, both implementation, enablement, and uh, usage as we go forward. Uh, and I'm not sure that we'll ever necessarily hit a plateau. Well, it's interesting you, you mentioned about BYOD, and we'll come back to that in a minute. And I want to be clear, the 2012 data we saw was specifically on IP phones. Mm -hmm. And we conf I confess we were surprised that that number showed a, a fairly decent increase because of things like BYOD and other so, Rowan, what do you think about plateau, cliff, up, down, sideways? Neither, up. I think it's going up. I don't think it's a plateau or a cliff. Um, but I don't think about the cat. I don't. It depends on how you define the category, frankly. And at Cisco, you know, we don't think necessarily about specifically about UC as uh, a discrete element. We think about collaboration technologies in general. And I see collaboration technologies in enterprise as poised for a huge rise with mobility, cloud, and social being three of the key drivers. Um, you know, I think people are coming into the office these days with a new expectation about how they should communicate, given the technologies that we now have access to at home. You know, when I leave my house and I've got access to incredible technologies generally for free, um, right. and I come into the office, and often for most people, they're taking a step back in time when they come into the office. And so there's a huge opportunity right now, I think, to really change the game in enterprise collaboration. And whether you call that UC or PBXs or this or that or the other thing, I don't think that's what's relevant. What's more, more relevant is can we introduce a new set of technologies to workers to make them more effective and give them a new pl platform to communicate on? And I think we can, and I think there's going to be huge growth. OK. Jan, um, Google, I should point out, uh, Jan Linden is very familiar with Enterprise Connect going back to VoiceCon. Google bought a company called Global IP Sound about four years ago, and Jan went over with that acquisition and has been the architect of, of WebRTC both within Google and I have to say within the whole industry, truly been driving this. So maybe you can, from Google's perspective and the enterprise communication space and you see, how do you see those things coming together at this point? Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, I, I really like what Rowan said. First of all, it's the definition that's, <laughs> it's all in definition. Obviously, collaboration and, and the communication is not going down in any, in, in, in any way. Uh, the way we look at it is very much around trying to, to remove the borders between the enterprise and the user, uh, end user, consumer type of uh, communication. It's really about providing a platform that's the same for everything, and then within that, you, of course, need the security, the privacy the, to, to uh, handle the different use cases, but the enterprise or your work thing is just one out of several different identities you might have, but they should all fit in together, and that's the platform we're building. Uh, so. okay. uh, Giovanni, Microsoft has been 
involved in enterprise communications in the, in the context of this conference and whatnot for quite a number of years now. Uh, but still, it's not exactly a PBX provider. It, Link is a different kind of a creature. So how, how are you guys approaching Look, this I, issue? I, I agree with what the others have said. Um, your question is very much a vendor question. How are PBX sales up and down, phone up and down? The reality of what is going to drive the industry is what people do. And, and so we are in the business of empowering people. Uh, and I completely agree that uh, people are people at home and at work, and the environment is very different, but fundamentally they're the same person, and that we need to provide a flawless experience uh, from when they're at home to when they're at work. And in that perspective, if I just look at it from my own, and I think I have quite sophisticated collaboration technology, there's tons of improvements that we can do. Uh, so that we at the beginning, you know, the, the, the question, I, I would just frame it in a very different way. Okay, we'll come back to that. Todd? Well, like the others, it's clearly growing out there, um, but it's transforming. And, you know, in some way, for everybody in the audience, they, they have to look at their workforce, and their workforce is changing. We talked last year about this influx of millennials, people born after 1980s. They have different work styles. They, they were born on the Internet. Um, they all have mobile phones. So the expectation of mobile communications and always on and connectivity, no matter where you're at, uh, is impacting what we all do here in terms of our technology. So we, we focus on how people can work in a more nomadic work style uh, anywhere they are, anytime, because that's the nature of the changes. Um, is voice part of that and is it growing? Sure, everybody uses voice, but it's evolved to all these other things. Voice has become a feature in the solution set for these users, and now all these users want a common user experience no matter where they go, regardless of whether it's web or it's a mobile device. Okay, Mike? What, what yeah, so I haven't heard anybody mention the word cliff, which is interesting, right? <laughs> I'm not going to say it. <laughs> you just did. It, 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 I, I mean, look, I, mean, I think ultimately, I mean, I, I think ultimately, look, I think, We're like good engineers. We never answer see. the question that's asked. We <laughs> change the question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or a politician. I mean, look, I, We're going up the I think we or? continue to see UC rise. It's a bumpy road because it's harder than our PowerPoint slides seem to indicate. Right? I mean, you have to challenge the integration requirements. You have to be able to fit into different kinds of environments. Um, so I think there's really two aspects. There's the out-of-the-box, off-the-shelf, shrink-wrapped edition of UC, which I think is selling well and selling easily. And then you've got the much more challenging large enterprise requirement where they want to be able to pull together all the different streams of communication and make it fit into their business process. And there, perhaps, we may have a skill set issue more so than we have a technology issue. Can we deliver the service reliably, quickly, and have it work consistently? So, you know, I, I wrote down words like remove the border and uh, borders between people uh, in their personal lives and private lives and breaking down. And, you know, I mean, for 15 years, anytime, any place, anywhere, networking, and, and communication has been growing, and it's been the norm for the better part of a decade here. So we're not talking about something new in that regard. But there still are barriers when we do focus groups, for example, and you talk to people in health verticals, they can't treat their, <coughs> their staff people the same way that those staff people behave in their personal lives. There's HIPAA, there's other sorts of things. Similarly, in the financial sectors, there's other kinds of issues. So if the notion is to remove the borders, is that really, uh, how are we gonna get there? I mean, just given the reality that we're not talking about what I do when I'm uh, celebrating on a Friday night, we're talking about something that, you know, I might get sued for, or has to be, it's gotta have n number of, of years of shelf life in, in discovery, and a whole bunch of other things where a regulator is coming, coming around. I'm, I'm just talking about the legal side of this. There's other dimensions. But is the notion that the barriers between personal and professional are going to break down, is that, is that real? The, the, the first thing that I would say is, you know, it, it is true we have been talking about some of the concepts as an industry for quite some time. Um, while the value is, you know, the North Star that we're reaching is always the same, I think the way we're getting it uh, is profoundly different of the way you would look at it 10 years ago, for example. No question. You know, new technologies have come to the board. I think I offer some, they offer others. 
Uh, and so from that point of view, I think you have to look at not only the value, but how we get there and who can get there first and who can really empower people the way you know, they want to. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think that that is important to separate the fact that yes, the value proposition is the same, how you get to it uh, might be very different and given Fred, that technology has evolved quite a bit. And yep. Fred, your, your, your scenario, right, healthcare, um, and moving the border. So, you know, we're working with an, an organization, a statewide healthcare initiative that looks at um, caregivers in certain facilities where the influx of patients isn't as great as in others. And how do I virtually move caregivers into these facilities so they can do a consult to a patient? Because I can't have them get in their car and drive to the other facility. So our technology, of course, allows these organizations to do that. So now these people in a secure way can take care of patients. Now, when we talk about moving the borders, it's not just the borders for the people who work inside organizations, it's for their customers and their clients and their patients. So we look at it and say, how many of us have gotten in a car to drive to our doctor and sit there to look at an MRI and you walk away from that event after driving and uh, spending $10 in gas and realize I could have done that over the web. So the ability to change the borders and do patient consults in a secure way um, will shift and change um, the way people work. And we're talking about using the same technology many of us built here. But if we, just to be, so be a little bit controversial, I mean, you've said we've been doing this for 10 years, but the only ubiquitous way that I can contact you today is your telephone number or your email address. I still can't video call you in a ubiquitous way. And I mean, what you guys are doing and what we're working on together there is one way to do that. But let's just be honest, I mean, look, you still can't make a video call to anyone in the world without having to know which walled garden they're in. We don't like, I don't like that. I don't think that's a good future. So we have basics to get to before we can you know, get to some of these other things. Well, you're a handsome man, I'm not, so I'm glad there's no video. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think one of the, the points you're making is a good one, which is uh, some of the barriers to these borders in the past has been the fact that you had to put so many disparate piece parts together to get it to be ubiquitous, right? And I think what we're seeing is that as we evolve to uh, solutions where you have the entire stack uh, to where I don't have to get 15 different vendors to try to come together to do that. Now video can be ubiquitous. The network can be ubiquitous. Security, as you mentioned, can be ubiquitous. So I think as the, as the market matures and you're starting to see true turnkey solutions, that is going to knock down a lot of these uh, borders. And it just, well, I think it would be impossible to survive as, as piece parts. And that's mm -hmm. been one of the barriers of, of you see your collaboration. But I don't think everyone will agree with you. I mean, I, I, I agree with you. I think that that stuff should be open, but I don't think everyone agrees. I think that there's, Microsoft still has the view that these things should be closed. Um. <laughs> it's funny, don't I was you? thinking exactly the same of you. <laughs> <laughs> Look, let me give you an example. Uh, just in terms of innovation, this is Microsoft focus, so I uh, will not bring other, others' name in it. I was actually checking with Microsoft IT the other day. Since Link has been rolled out, uh, we are now federated with over 7,000 companies. So you're talking about resolving barriers. Right. Uh, now Microsoft can essentially connect with 95% of our suppliers and partners. That's amazing. That would have never been possible three years ago. Yeah. Uh, well, we're, we're, you know, and, that, and that is just an example. So but I was you talk about call, terms of openness. I was trying to in video call to of, see my son last night. And you know, she's got an Android or an iPhone or I don't know what. I mean, how am I going to do that ubiquitously, right? I mean, and she no, has a web browser. A key with WebRTC <laughs> yet, so I got to get you on the horn. You know, this is clearly yeah. a key element, and this is if you're if you're not able to resolve the user experience successfully, then all of these sort of you know barriers that are that, that are there. And I and I agree with you. I think the WebRTC movement will certainly help to flatten that. But ultimately, you got to make the end user happy, and I think you know we. And I think we've sort of continued to find ways to do that incrementally. But I think now there. I think now we need to see the big bang effect. Well, it's a great point. I'll come to. I know Jim wants to jump in in here, but you know, these barriers weren't established by some deity. Uh, <laughs> each each one of you guys has a certain business plan, uh, and it's by. Design. It didn't happen by accident. And I, I remember right. when SIP first came out, the promise of SIP was, holy crap, man, I'm going to be able to get a $29 phone for every place, plug and play, hoop-de-doo, not. 
So again, uh, to your point, it, it, it was, my question was kind of a vendor question. You're right, uh, none of you guys are buyers, so you're all sellers. And, and we do, we're in this world because of decisions that you all have made. So, you know, is there, if we, if my I goodness, agree, this is on us, this isn't light. on customers. <laughs> no customer wants this. I mean, right. I don't think. Right. Yeah. Well, we could talk about this for a very long time, so I'm going to change the subject. Uh, I would say one thing is the observer in the marketplace, every one of these vendors has reasons why they would like to keep it not open. And so they throw out, well, yeah, we follow standards. Well, anybody that follows SIP knows, yeah, there's, they call it a standard, but interoperability is always an issue. And everybody has APIs to help make things work a little bit easier. So. The reality is that uh, that's a long way to go. Its battles will be fought, and for good reason, some of them will be fought. But I'm going to change the subject now. A, a number of years ago, and I guess it was 2009, at the last VoiceCon in San Francisco, there was a panel very similar to this, except there was no Google and no Microsoft on stage. It was all PBX vendors. Uh, in fact, as I recall, even Toshiba was on this panel. And the discussion about what's the future of the PBX Every vendor on that panel agreed that the PBX was dead. And I thought it was pretty fascinating because if you followed what happened after that, for a number of years after that, every one of these PBX vendors to stay alive had to continue to sell PBXs. So at UC Strategies, when we started that website, we published information saying, you don't need a new PBX. You can get by with what you've got if you can interact with that. And so, if the PBX is dead, and as some of them have said, you no longer need to buy a new PBX from us, we're, we're working in collaboration, we're working on other things. The question is, what will the next PBX be like? What will it be? And I'll just throw out two scenarios for you, and you can comment on either one of those or anything else. One of them is, will WebRTC, excuse me, WebRTC be the solution? Will that be how we connect in the future without replace the PBX? Or will it be something where you're in a chat with someone and you click a button to take you to a voice call, maybe even up to a video call, that's very similar to what some people are delivering today, but you don't really need a PBX to do that. So we'll start yeah. the panel going back this way. Yeah, so I think in the case of enterprise voice services, again, whether you call it a PBX, whether you call it an application server, Again, at the end, the end user sort of the end, I guess the end user sort of requirement, whether it be around you know like a boss secretary arrangement or other kinds of special kinds of services, you will need a purpose-built application for that particular user story. Now, perhaps the majority of the users, the knowledge workers and so forth, perhaps can get by with a much much simpler dialing plan and maybe use WebRTC for for much more simple you know, business business you know, business you know, feature set. So I think you have to have both. You have to be able to support the factory floor, as well as the knowledge worker, as well as the boss secretary arrangements. So I, I think there is still a place for a PBX, quote unquote, but it may come in a different form, form factor than what we've been seeing in the past. Somebody else from Siemens was on that panel. <laughs> it wasn't him. It wasn't him. <laughs> Somebody else from NEC. I, I don't <laughs> but uh, so I think voice, from the traditional PBX sense has certainly evolved. You know, we, we see it as evolving as a feature within the overall set that's delivered inside the enterprise. And obviously, voice communications isn't going any, away anytime soon. And remember, if we, if we turn back time even further, there was a holy grail that we introduced in our industry called SIP that was going to solve all the world's problems, too. So I think we've got to be cautious. There is some very cool technology with WebRTC that is going to enable new capabilities to unbridled communications with people uh, inside your enterprises. It's going to take a while to evolve. Um, the same way the introduction of IP voice and the introduction of unified communications has been taking a while to evolve inside the deployments as it replaces or, or brings voice with it as a feature set. Yeah, you know, in general, I struggle with these questions because they're so high level, right? And, and, and it's always so easy for a vendor or anybody to really provide a very antagonistic view of the, of the market. Um, and so I, I, to me, it, again, what we want to make you know, productive are people. And, and, and if PBXs are needed to make people productive over an evolution of PBXs, so be it. I, I don't know if the, the view of is it dead or alive it really makes any sense. Are we making people productive? Are they doing things that they cannot do 
five, seven years ago. And if you look at it, there's a continued evolution of, of what people can do with any of our technologies here on the panel. And so from that perspective, from a Microsoft point of view, uh, you know, that, that's our job. Our job is to make people productive. Our job is to make them to connect with anything that they want. Voice communication is universal. There are going to be antagonistic technologies in the market. We need to find a way to interoperate. I'm sure that we will debate on the way we interoperate. We will always find a way to come together and come to terms, and the world will continue to evolve. And so long as that happens, that's the most important thing. Yeah, I don't believe in WebRTC. No, <laughs> <laughs> no obviously, uh, I, I, I really think that, so, so I would focus on WebRTC, that the thing here is this is not about replacing all the, the other back-end uh, app service or whatever. It's about making sure that every single client can talk the same way that's on the browser. That means a huge difference. It still means that you have interoperability issues with old stuff, etc., and, the, and you, you still have a tremendous opportunity to innovate uh, in the PBX, on the PBX side. But what that enables is a standard client that everyone can use. And it can be implemented on, any, on hardware as well, so it doesn't have to be just in a regular browser. But also, what I, in my mind is more important is that this makes it easy to integrate voice and video with everything else. It's because that's the real shift. And unified collaboration is about that, but you still haven't really seen much uh, of this from, uh, compared to what you will see. That it's so easy to, for a web developer to put in, into what your all kinds of applications and as long as you, in the back end, make sure that it all hooks up in the right way, you can put it in everywhere exactly where you need it instead of grabbing the phone or whatever you need to do uh, when, when you need to contact someone. It's in the flow of what yeah. you're doing. That, that's where I think it Amen. really changes the game. Can, yeah, can I ask, how many applications do you actually have right now running WebRTC doing the thing that you were just describing? Uh, I, I, you know, how real is it? I love uh, the idea. How real okay, is uh, it today? Yeah, I, I mean, there are obviously a, a lot of early applications. There's the, 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 the most clear example right now is some of these uh, providers like Twilio, etc., that have an option. You can use a WebRTC client or you can use a Flash or whatever. That's the first step towards it. But there are plenty of... Uh, people like these on, on this panel here that have basically uh, a new solution based on WebRTC. It's not been rolled out yet because one of the reasons is obviously that it's early in the game. Only Chrome is fully, or not even fully implemented, but we are very far along, but it's, it's moving along. So it's not gonna, well, you're not gonna use tuned. it much today. Yeah, yeah. stay tuned. It's, it's <laughs> really happening much front. faster than many of the other revolutions yeah. you see because it's, it's for example, uh, the browsers, they're updated every six weeks in our case. So whatever release, you don't have to, to wait for that big release. Uh, of course, Microsoft browsers are not yet there, but it's, it's uh, getting but, but I, quicker. But at the same time, no, look, at the same time, we have over 3,000 applications right now built on, on HTML5 and you know, it, it, technology that exists today. So long as the ball keeps moving forward, we'll take the best, we'll move it forward. That's the, you know, that's the game. Well, uh, well, you know, the, the, this is one of the things I love about this, it, it, because it, you, you were right, Giovanni. You said something a moment ago. It's very high level, so let's, let's knock this down. Jim asked, you know, what's the future of the PBX? Let me ask the same question, but in a different way, because it is the job of the buyer to put a business case together. It is the job of the buyer to have some kind of TC, TCO and ROI yeah. analysis. And it is, uh, in a finance way, there's depreciation and all these other ugly things that determine what real buyers in the real world do. So I guess I'd like to maybe phrase um, Jim's question a different way. If I'm shopping for a communications and collaboration platform, um, and I'm visiting the show floor uh, this week, and I hope each one of you spends time there. Um, you know, how, I need to write a five-year plan. What am I gonna see? He, how's, how's what's gonna be uh, down the road five years gonna compare to what I'm gonna see on the floor today, and how do I kinda fill in the blanks to my management, both from a feature function and a cost standpoint? Because you're right, things change all the time, and, and they roll. 
but uh, but there seems to be um, uh, a quicker spin of the wheels right now. So here's how we think. Uh, here's how I think about this <clears throat> to keep going on this previous discussion. But uh, I think about whether you call it a PBX or a UC or basically I think about on-premise infrastructure. And on-premise infrastructure within an, within an enterprise is going to have a place. But right, the, obviously the huge trend now, as we saw from some of the very innovative companies, and congratulations to those folks for, for, for their work, um, where we're seeing the most innovation and the most uh, you know, acceleration is really in the cloud. And so what we're working on is we're working on a strategy that moves us to that place where we can deliver all of the solutions from the thing that is ubiquitous, the cloud. Uh, modified, extended, and enhanced by on-premise infrastructure. So not leaving any of that infrastructure behind. Because there's, there's going to be a place for that uh, for a long time. But there also is going to be a need for ubiquitous connectivity wherever you are, whether you're in Starbucks or whether you're in a boardroom. And so you need to have the thing that's always around, which is the cloud, always accessible and delivering the full stack, in my opinion. Uh, but if you have on-premise infrastructure, and you can run it at scale, and you have a variety of other requirements from the security or countries or whatever the requirements are, well, then I think there's going to be a place for on-premise inf infrastructure. Yeah. And so that's how we think about it. We think about delivering primarily from the cloud, but then extending through on-premise infrastructure uh, to really add value and, and continue to support a lot of use cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, a lot of that I would agree with. I think uh, if I'm putting that plan together over the next five years, uh, firstly, uh, uh, companies have been doing that for in the data world for quite a long time. Now in this communications and collaboration space, they've got to think about uh, how does my network work for that versus how does it work for data? How does my security, I've thought a lot about security on the data side. Gee, I haven't given it much thought on, on the collaboration side. Uh, so again, I get back to this entire stack. Uh, there's going to have to be investment in my network's better and it's built for these types of uh, capabilities. My security is better. The way I deploy things, whether I want those in the cloud, whether I want those on premise, where I want hybrid in that. I have to think about a different world of endpoints, whether these are soft endpoints, hard endpoints, mobility. So I really have to think about that entire solution. Uh, and, then, and then, of course, from the user point of view, how's it going to be used? And that's going to be all the way from the end customer, because they're going to be coming in through portals to work through contact centers or the enterprise. I'm going to have to think about my contact center agents. I'm going to have to think about my enterprise workers, I'm going to think about who I'm federated with, business to business. So I think you really have to take that entire solution, the entire stack into play there uh, as you're looking at these investments. We're going to see a lot of the evaluation that was done in the data world being done essentially again in the mobility, collaboration, and UC space. Yeah, I guess I would also add that we really need to keep in mind and really kind of look for strategies that are really you know, mobile, mobile first. Um, I think too often uh, the vendors in our space have d developed, let's say, for desktop environments and then tried to migrate or some, some element of that to the mobile device. I think it has to be turned on its head. You really got to go mobile, mobile, mobile first, and then and make sure that it's a completely rich experience, whether you're using an iPad, an Android device, et cetera. Um, because this is how people will continue to consume, especially like in a cloud model. What's more freeing, right? Than not, I mean, not only not having an enterprise infrastructure, yeah. like an IT application suite, con let's say consuming the service from a cloud on your preferred mobile device. That's, that's just, I think yeah, that's... I, I agree. Turning on, you I think mean, about what's turning on its head. You, I think you've got to go, for this audience, you need to go back and think about who are, you, who are you buying technology for, right? Of course they use mobile. You won't find a vendor here that doesn't have technology in all forms. But... You know, I'm doing a session this week that specifically focuses on planning for what we call a nomadic workforce, which, you know, consider that half of your workforce has grown up differently, and they want to use technology in a different way. And you need to really think about where do you have offices? Some of those are right for deploying on-premise technologies. Other offices are probably right for servicing out of the cloud. How do those two work together? So we've spent a lot of time focusing on leveraging the software technology we build for premises inside the cloud infrastructure so that user experience doesn't change as you look at how you deploy it around the globe. So again, take that back to who are the people you're building it for? Who are you deploying it for? What are their work styles? Where do they work? What offices and workspaces do they work in? How is that changing? Walk down your cubicles in your office and count how many people are actually in an office anymore. 
but really changes a lot. Well, don't say that but to the it, Yahoo CEO. She might right. have to say that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that place is full. But, 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 that, that is a separate conversation. <laughs> but, uh, but I'd like to return to something Mike said. If I think mobile first, am I going to think about the people or the companies represented on this panel? I mean, Google, Android is not, a, you know, it, it's a different kind of delivery system. Microsoft now, with the, the latest release, maybe we'll start to see some more mobile. But right. they've got a Windows I mean, phone. Well, mobile I, you see, uh, well, more than I don't each think of these guys have, have their to, own vested interest in their own platform. So some of us don't have a vested right. interest in a mobile platform. We're focused platform. on the mobile app and itself. So we will move right. absolutely aggressively towards mobile first strategy. I mean, that, that, is, yeah. the, that is the direction that, that we're taking. Absolutely. I know a lot of the folks are. It's yes. the right thing yeah. to do. I mean, and I think all of us want it, not just because we're hearing it from customers, because we ourselves are walking around and backstage. Sure. We need to be able to communicate and collaborate yeah. I mean, the, the, in any not, way that we want. It's not an Android. The, the reality but, but let me just it. comment on one last thing. Sure. You can't just take what you've done on premise and do it the same way you do it in, in, in the mobile world. It doesn't work that way. You have to rebuild and rethink things for mobile first. Mm -hmm. And you have to think about them across all of the platforms, not just for your own platform. Right. The user stories are different. Yeah, and you really have totally to different. understand that before you can actually create the application that brings all of these UC services. You know, video anywhere, social anywhere. And then again, tying that back to your sort of valued business, business applications. Sure, I mean, just things just as simple as, you know, high definition, low bandwidth. If you don't have that, you have no hope in the mobile world. So you really do have to think differently right from the ground up. Yeah. Uh, you're still going to have call control. You're still going to have feature servers. But, but you do have to think differently about where it's going to be deployed and how it's going to be Well, even the, the ease in which you can deploy it to the end user, right? Once you have something in the, in the client, then there's connectivity and, and the, uh, the quality of that connectivity. But you know, we spent a lot of time at NEC looking at our software architecture to look at how is the technology actually delivered to the mobile user. It's not an operating system issue, it's a application deployment issue. And what does that user use to log in on one client versus the other? And does the user experience change when I go from a tablet to an iPhone? to you know, my desktop? Does it change when I go home and I want to use my Mac versus my Windows machine? Uh, how do you get a common user experience for these people and make it easy to deploy? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so we, we well, just the, got the, the good thing is that there are a lot of marketplaces right now on yeah. mobile phones, so that's actually relatively easy if you believe that users will just go there yeah. and pick up the latest app and connect to the... Yeah, WhatsApp has It is, but the question is, users, where did the app come from? What does it look and feel like? <laughs> are the same contacts in there? Am I importing differently? And, and there's implementation approaches that can really streamline not only what you do on the infrastructure. Remember, we're deploying inside of the enterprise infrastructure, tying in, as you know, to all the existing environments, and then ensuring that my common user credentials, my um, contact list, there's a lot of consistency no matter where I go. But I would argue that the whole word deployment is just an old school word. The, the, the idea is that user experience, that. In, in this space, it should be users demanding and pulling applications. Consumption is And anyone can do yeah. that with the app stores and the various ways that you can get software today. And so yeah. I think that it's just changing the mindset of enterprise software development to really think mobile first. Because, right. I mean, I was going to say, I said earlier, but you know, WhatsApp has 300, arguably 250 to 350 million users and 35 employees. I don't think they're having a problem with deployment. They think about these things differently. And that, so I think we're, you, you said, is it going to be these companies? I think the answer is maybe. Maybe some of them will survive. Maybe some of them won't in this form. But there are also going to be new companies in the mobile space, folks who think about this first and enter this space first and really are thinking about mobile first. And you're just seeing that a lot of the barriers to getting into, enterprise, the, into the enterprise stack have been removed. Yeah. And I think, so, and I think I we're think even moving from your BYOD that's been around a while now to bring your own apps. Right, where basically the end user wants to be able to select which applications are relevant for them in their particular business. Now, will our IT really sort of embrace that and allow it? It's bound to. Well, and the, the, the question is, is what, can the, what can IT offer to the end user that, that empowers them to you know, be more productive in their workforce? So I'd say, it, it, we talk about BY, bring your own device. Let's come from the IT side and say, I'm going to EYOD, I'm going to enhance your own device <laughs> with applications that I can deliver in an easy way that enhance your work style, mm -hmm. right? So as long as they're there, and long as they're easy to deploy, 
uh, it, it's going to change the way the users can work inside of your organization. And, and to some extent, easy to develop. I mean, you know, we talked earlier about the openness, right? And, and I mean, let's face it, going back to the PBX days, you know, the systems typically haven't been very open. And so, you know, we think about this, this idea of this whole next generation of middleware that's just going to completely open these up to the point where IT departments very rapidly can develop uh, internal applications, sure. right? That it could be pushed these out very, very quickly. But, but also, uh, the, the, you, you talk a lot about the issues with apps and security and all that. That's why putting it in the browser that is the same on the, the mobile device as on the desktop, right. that gives you some control that mm -hmm. uh, helps that situation a lot. And, and, uh, and we're getting there, we're not there today, it's still <laughs> more efficient. But for example, real-time communication is one of those things that actually doesn't cost more to do in the browser than doing in an app because all the heavy lifting is, is done natively and then you just have some JavaScript on top of it. It's the stuff that where you have to do a lot in JavaScript that is expensive to do on the, on, on the mobile like, uh, browser, but not. Uh, and, and where there's a real promise there is embedding. I mean, you said it earlier, yeah. but embedding in the unique ways that we haven't even thought about yet, mm -hmm. that's uh, where it becomes interesting, actually, but it is the, one. It's one use case. You know, there, yeah. There's one use case that the browser, the browser is going to be embedded in ways where it doesn't look like a browser. Yeah, you I have a view that makes it. But I also I think actually, there's going to be native. I actually think that too. the unique problem is scale. Yeah. And if we want to get to billions of people connected, scale is going to be the key exactly. issue of all this. Well, I'm hoping that we, we have billions of people at Enterprise Connect 2014. And based upon the conversation that you guys have had, you've set the table for the week, and I can't thank you enough. We're going to have sessions on WebRTC. We're going to be having sessions on uh, interoperability and federation. We're going to be having sessions on the future of uh, the device. We've got cloud summits, mobility summits. You guys have done a great job of uh, setting the table for the rest of the show. Um, you didn't answer one of my questions. Of course. <laughs> uh, okay. I want to thank you. We will be taking a break uh, now and invite you guys to go to lunch. And we'll be reconvening here at 1 o'clock for the Mobile UC Summit. I hope you'll join me in thanking the panel. They did a great job. Thank you. Thanks. Nice meeting you. Thank you.